in the ideal individual, there's zero fear. Right, but tr trust is not without its risks. When we're looking at our fears, we also have to get rid of the fear. In order to look at it. At the end of the day, there is one truth. King David in his Psalms said, taste and you will find that God is good. So if what you're tasting is not good to you, then you haven't tasted God. A bird doesn't stand relaxed on a branch because it trusts the branch. Rather, it trusts its wings. Welcome to the In Search of More podcast. I am your host, Ellie Nash. Join me weekly on my quest for more, more from myself and more from this world. We'll see you on the other side. All right, welcome back. Welcome back. Should we talk about um, Jewish-Black relations? It seems to be the hot topic right now. <laughs> Let's jump into it. Not, we got not. one of those few Jewish-Black relationships that's working, apparently. <laughs> we'll let other people deal with that, uh, that topic. For sure. Okay, so... You know, oftentimes we hear about like the work, right? People doing the work. I'm not talking about Byron Katie's the work. I'm just mm -hmm. talking about in general, right? If people are stumbling along this discussion, they're right. probably interested on some level in, um, in, in doing that. So what I w wanted to have a discussion about is the, like what that is, what the destination is through the work, what the work is. And uh, I thought it could be helpful because sometimes we, we just want to know, like, what's the, what's the step we take? What's the next thing we got to do? Am I, am I done? Am I in the, you know, I had a trainer who once told me, uh, you know, Sammy. Yeah, yeah. What's up, Sammy? What's up, Sammy? We'll send this to him. So Sammy told me when you're trying to build, you need like five days a week in the gym. When you're trying to maintain, like three days a week in the gym. So an obvious diet, of course, perfect diet. <laughs> just kidding. All right. So, you know, same here with this stuff. What is the building phase? What is the maintenance phase? What is, you know, right. Yeah, so frame it up for me. What, for you, what, what is the work? What does it entail? Okay, so I'm going to have a hard time. I, I don't usually like going here, right, in terms of, um, like, spirituality, God. I, I, I like to talk about topics. Obviously, it's a big part of my belief and the way I view the world, but I understand that it's not for everyone. Mm -hmm. So if I can introduce topics in ways that don't require me to go there, I prefer to. Sometimes it's sometimes it's necessary. As an example for that, you're familiar with Wim Hof. Yeah. So Wim Hof, one of the reasons he's gained popularity is because a lot of the things he was saying about breath work and about let's just say breath work, right? And right. Th that ability to go inward and center oneself, where a lot of other people introduced it in very hocus pocus terminology. Mm -hmm. He just showed the science of it. This part of the brain is slowing down, right. the blood cells are doing this, and he actually you know, went himself and with others and demonstrated that his breathing patterns actually changes something physio physiologically. And then people were saying, oh, that's okay. Like now I can ingest what he's saying. Right. When other people said things similar, but it sounded like, oh, the breath Esoteric. of God you're taking in into right, the, right. the universe and the cosmos. And through that, you're balancing your chakras. Like, Whoa. Right. <laughs> what are you talking about? Well, I want to do Why do you think that is though? Meaning like on one hand, the relationship um, with God and, and certainly the spiritual aspect of it is like, it's a thing of almost everyone's life, right? But in certain contexts, when you deliver a message through that lens, it's like, uh, I don't know. So I'll share from personal experience, which is the way I prefer to do it. There was a time where anything with the word God was alienating to me. Mm. And it took the desperation that I felt um, as a result of not being able to stop the things I was addicted to, pornography, other forms of sex addiction, to enter a program that reintroduced God to me, not because it wasn't alienating, it was. I was just so desperate, I pushed through it. And we've had that discussion in the past where, you know, when you look at the steps, the word God is only in the third step. So I said, you know what, I'm not looking that far into it. I'm so desperate for what this is offering me. And I saw people around the room who seemed to have it so I said, okay, I'll take it literally one step at a time, one day at a time, and not worry about that. However, the point I'm making is that it did alienate me. And in my case, the reason it did is because uh, there was a lot of, um, I guess, pain introduced into my life under the name of God. The banner of God, right. Exactly. So I think that, you know, it's one of the reasons those who claim to represent God whether they're rabbis or priests or clergy or even saying it, mm. God wants, you tell a child, God wants X, Y, or Z from you. 
that's right. it's yeah. polarizing 100 percent. and something i often uh repeat is you know king david in his psalms said taste and you will find that god is good mm. taste and you will find that, that god is good and I'll often ask people about their relationship with god their understanding of it i say well whatever that is is it good Sometimes there's a judgmental God or a harsh God or a punitive God or called the Old Testament God. Mm. And that relationship has brought a lot of pain to them. So if I'm talking to someone who respects on some level the Psalms, even in that dimension of the brain, maybe they've said God doesn't exist, but if he does exist, he's a Jewish God and King David, right? right, right. So I, I can use that as a reference point and say, well, King David has said that when you will taste God, you will find that it is good. So if what you're tasting is not good to you, then you haven't tasted God. So try again, fire that one. You've probably adopted someone else's, but I digress a little bit only to answer your question that for me, for a time that was a four letter word. God was a four letter word. So if you wanted me to hear something, instead of bringing up my defenses, bring it down, say it without the word God, but I don't have a good way of introducing this part of the work without this concept without going there a little bit so you have to frame it up yeah. so let's talk about the destination right the destination is to be in a space where we're living our purpose we um feel like we matter our contribution matters in an act of service right? and we're doing something meaningful towards the world that will leave the world better than it was when we came in and we have a specific set of skills and talents, abilities, experiences, resources in order to be able to further a very specific, a very specific goal. And I think being in that space of feeling purposeful, feeling meaningful, living a life of service, that's the eventual goal. Feeling connected to the universe. And the, in the language of the 12 steps, the 11 step is, talks about a conscious contact with God being conscious of our contact with God. So that would be a destination. Now, s someone can be living an act of service, and I'm sure we all have examples of people in our life, who it doesn't seem to be coming from a conscious contact mm -hmm. with anything. It seems to be their own fears, their own insecurities that they need to resolve by helping others, saving others, or doing something else for others. So if we just talk about purpose and meaning, that's a destination, right? The destination is to feel meaningful, feel like I matter, contributing to the world, living a life of service, um, taking care of ourselves as well, the, the confidence, the self-esteem, all of that, that's the destination. That makes sense? That resonate? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, <clears throat> and I think the, the, the journey towards the destination um, can sometimes change the destination or the idea of it, right? 100%. So um, I think which, with every person and, and their journey, um, whatever comes at them for whatever reason kind of skews that destination. So it, it's, they start out looking at it one way and then like halfway through the journey, they're like, you know, maybe I was wrong. But when you use the word skews, it suggests like something negative happens to the destination versus it creates it in some fashion. It directs it. When we can look at something we're doing and saying, I can have a meaningful impact on this subject because of my past experiences, that's not skewing it. That's creating it. What, what do you say about the people? Um, I, I know some people, for them, the destination is to like arrive and then get out of the way. Like don't pour back into anything, you know, not disrupting is as good as leaving the world better than they found it. Like just kind of fading off. Like whether it's like you got married, you settled down, you had kids, you retired from your, whatever the case is, and then like just stay out of the way. What do you think about that? Let me, let me ask you this question. If Sincere, your son, got to that place, mm -hmm. would you be proud of him or would you want him to give back in some fashion? As his dad, I would want him to give everything back. To drop like a rope. empty yourself, yeah, for right, sure. To drop a rope. Drop a rope. Right. So that's a destination. I think that it's not for everyone, right? Someone else has a different destination. If someone, if someone else, if someone has a destination, for example, of making the most money they can mm -hmm. in their life, then listen to a different podcast. Like that's not. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. It's not this one. Not that that can't be part of the life. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that 
It's, it's something we both value and want in our lives is an abundance of wealth in order to be able to do the things we do, not just to accumulate, but to, to create. So then the question becomes, what gets in the way of those things? And then that becomes the work. The work is clearing out those things. So from a 12 steps framework, if, if I had to sum it up into four areas, it would be the stuff that get in the way are, are fears. There's absolutely no room for fears in, a, um, in that ideal, right? There's, the, the ideal is this is where we're trying to get to. Right. We're going to get maybe to 50% of the ideal, 60%, maybe 99%. Very few people get to 100% of the ideal. But in the ideal individual, there's zero fear. I heard this from someone I never counted, is that the most common instruction or phrase in the Bible is al-tira, do not fear, or some variation of that. God continuously instructing, do not fear, do not fear. Fear is the enemy. Mm -hmm. So that's one. And in the 12 steps, it's a big part of it. When they say step four, doing a, a, fear, um, a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves it's interesting that when we're looking at our fears, we also have to get rid of the fear. In order to look at it. In order, right. We have to get rid of that fear of looking at the truth about ourselves. Sometimes just being honest that, hey, like I have all these fears. That took me a while to acknowledge all of these fears. So that's one, fears. Second category, resentments. And, uh, and I'm just using this as a framework right. for, um, for this. There are a lot of different ways to arrive at similar ideas. One thing we will find is that across religions, across ideologies, uh, uh, frameworks are a lot of similarities because at the end of the day, there is one truth. I don't think you're going to find a spiritually disciplined life that has a lot of room for fear, whether it's the 12 steps or Judaism or uh, Sufism or right. Buddhism or something else, right? There is whatever not a lot of room for fears. What? Right. Yeah, I uh, said so whatever ism. And, and I'll touch on something that you just mentioned with, you know, looking at ourselves truthfully. Um, that's definitely part of the work, in my opinion. Like being able to honestly look at yourself, look at ourselves with all the BS casted Same. away. And I believe in that so much that I remember um, one of the first times I looked at myself truthfully. Like I distinctly remember like having like this visceral feeling like, oh, wow, like I casted out every excuse. No one was around figuratively and literally, it was just me. And I remember looking at myself and I had to come to terms with something at a time. And I was like, wow, like it's on me. Like it's, it's, it's not what I thought, like I, this story I've been telling myself. And that was super powerful. So yeah, I think that's part of the work too. And that's, that's, really the, that's really the first step, mm. right? That's number one. If you can't be honest about the problem, then, then you're still in therapy. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. right. You're, you're still doing that there. You know, that's why they call a psychiatrist a shrink. Why? To shrink the ego long enough to get the truth mm. through. That's, that's what know. I heard. Whether it's right. something that someone figured out afterwards or the original reason it started, that's, it's so hard at first just to deliver the truth to someone like you're saying, right. to honestly look at ourselves. That's the first, that's the first step. I'm kind of working backwards in terms of, okay, we have the goal of being purposeful, meaningful, mm -hmm. service oriented, fulfilling our potential, all of those things. And then what are the stuff that get in the way? So we said fears, resentments are mm -hmm. a huge one, uh, which we'll discuss. And then guilt and shame. All of those things, there is no room for in the life has no room for fears, resentments, guilt, or shame. Yeah, that definitely lands. I think, um, I think all of those are, are huge challenges for most of us. And it's, it's something that we should all be conscious of and like go after. But I think that a lot of people don't even realize that like the journey that they're on is actually to kind of address these things that get in the way for everybody. I think they're looking at it like a lot of people tend to look at it and maybe it's just societal, right? Like you're so, you're like bludgeoned to death every day with the, the, the weight of society that you don't even realize. It's like, like, it's not that you don't want to do this, it's that you're afraid, right? 100%. And it, it's just showing up like this, right? Oh, we had that, you're not confused, you're scared, right? We had you're not that, confused, obviously. you're scared, The amount right? of fears that hold us back, even in, in this, right? This is something that obviously we're doing this because we both feel that it furthers our purpose in some way. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I'd be here. You'd be here. There's no one paying for this. It's 
Right. It's an investment of time and money. And saying the reason is because it furthers, or I speak for myself, because I feel like it's furthering my purpose in some way by sharing some of, you know, the hard le- hard earned, hard learned information. Yeah. Uh, and I second that definitely for me too. And, and, and for me on my journey, like, you know, I, I tell when I speak to people and friends and colleagues, I will, you know, ask me um, anything about my journey. I, I often say like, don't be like me. A lot of the times I had to, I was forced to change. And that's like a valuable lesson that I've learned on the journey that like, you want to change before you're forced to change. Exactly. It's inevitable, but like <laughs> if you can get a head start on it, it's probably better because man, like for me, so many times it, I was forced to change rock Same. bottom, Same. hitting the wall. Like, and then it's like, Same. and it, but even that, when you say forced to change, there are variations of that force. You felt forced to change because there was a level of pain that you were not willing to go beyond to get honest and said, Hey, Hey, I gotta, I gotta look at this instead of continuing to make excuses. So whatever that was for you, in my case, you know, the rock bottom of addiction is something that really forced me to get honest and put people around me who are going to say it like it was, and it's going to sit there long enough to hear it and work through those things. In your case, it may, whatever it was, right. right. Relationships. Was a lot of, yeah. A lot of it was around relationships. A lot of it was, um, around potential, you know, and like knowing that I'm underperforming in a lot of different facets in my life and just having to be honest, like, why, why is that? And right. then hit rock bottom and say, All right, I can't do this anymore. Like, this is crazy. I felt this thing inside of me as long as my memory goes back and I'm not doing it, you know, like, All right, I gotta, I gotta get up and do this. So, um, yeah, no, for sure. That resonates. And I think, I think it's, um, it's a worthwhile endeavor right? Because we know, like, the compass is already there. The North Star is there. Our vision, you know, it might get a little cloudy sometimes, but we know what we have to do. We know what we're here for, ultimately. I think all of us know what we're here for. We might forget in the day-to-day um, and f- seeking out reminders, right? As you go on that journey, I think it's, it's a worthwhile endeavor. 100%. And um, for me, I'm so grateful for the framework that 12 Steps gave for me in this way. If I had to sum up the 12 Steps, it's trying to work through your fears, resentments, guilt, and shame in order for you to get to a space that you can be conscious of that contact with God. You have a framework for continuously clearing the pipes so that fear, resentment, guilt, and shame don't, as they come up, as much of, as much as possible gets cleaned up. You stay conscious in that. And then you're saying, okay, how do I fulfill my purpose and mission from that, from that state? Now, in order to do that, you got to be honest with yourself, number two, and you got to believe in yourself. Mm-hmm. And you got to be willing to trust. Others so, and yourself? Others and yourself, exactly. Or, or a process. And those are, right, if we stack it, we're trying to get to this space. What gets in the way? We have all these... Fear, resentment, guilt, and shame. I think for most of us, those are bad words. People aren't walking around and thrilled that they have fears, resentments, guilt, and shame. They may use different words for it, confuse themselves as to to what it is. Mm -hmm. Going back to that podcast, you're not confused. You're afraid. Mm -hmm. As as one example of the way we confuse things, but if we're willing to be honest with ourselves or if we're willing to bring other people in our life who can hold that mirror for us and say, hey, this is what's really going on. This is a fear that you have. No one wants no, every, I think everyone agrees that those are bad words, but then what gets in the way? So, so many of us have lost trust. We've been hurt at a vulnerable age as kids. And because of that, we don't trust. So it's hard to trust a process. It's hard to trust other people. It's hard to trust a system. And because of that, we don't, we don't really go in. We're afraid that, hey, if I sit with someone and I'm honest with them, they will come back and use that against me in some fashion later as an example. And some people do, it's not, these fears aren't unfounded. Right. It's happened to some of us. Right. So, so finding those, finding a, a group of people who can handle that or a person who can handle that, all these things are important. And then eventually committing oneself to a process, which we trust. But if I don't believe in myself and if I don't, um, if I'm not honest about where I actually am, then, then those things can't work. So I, I thought it was important that we have this conversation. So as we're talking about the work, we at least have something to refer back to as a definition, a working definition for us. This is not an absolute truth for everyone, but as we're using it, if, is there anything that I've said that 
disagree with, want to add to. I mean, you've had a lot, but yeah, no, it's that. good. And I'm just thinking about what you said about about you know the truth, like that that keeps coming up, and um, and trust also, right? So I'll ask you, like, how does I know you mentioned support system, like how else can someone get back to a place of trust in themselves and others um, after they've been hurt, right? Even if it's trusting a process, like how, how does, what's that work like? Like meaning to, it's like, it's one of those, it's like a void, like in order to trust, you got to be able to trust, but trust is trusting, but you don't trust. Right. But tr trust is not without its risks, you know? So just because I say now I have trust doesn't mean that now I have a guarantee that it's going to be perfect. So the real trust comes back to trusting oneself, right? We, we really, we really want to build ourselves to the point that we understand that we can handle the inevitable bumps of life. Uh, there's a quote I love and I'll um, misspeak it a little bit, but it's something to the effect of a, a bird doesn't stand relaxed on a branch because it trusts the branch, rather it trusts its wings. So that becomes a huge part of it. And one of the, the three prerequisites, I said, before we can go into the fears, resentments, guilt, and shame, the three prerequisites are A, being honest about what, doesn't have to be honest about all of it, right? Because it's come later, but be honest that there's something in our life that's not working. Right. A, B, belief in ourself. C, trust, trust the process. So that belief in ourself, we have to rebuild that. And it's not only belief in ourselves, it's also belief in, in the world in some way. And yeah. the, the, best way, the best way to do that, uh, that I found, is start consciously paying attention to those things that are working in our favor. Because it's easy to say, you can't trust anyone. Really, you can't trust anyone? For the most part, I mean, we got in the car, drove here, and everything worked. Right. Yeah, my car broke down yesterday, uh, so I can't give that example. But the Uber worked. Right. <laughs> and the guy yeah. drove to the right destination, and there wasn't anyone shooting us on the street. And right. there, wasn't, there were people following the streetlights, and we got here safely, and you got here. And there's a sense that you don't know exactly where your kids are right now. I don't know exactly where my kids are right now, but there's a sense that they're okay because yesterday they were and the day before they were. And by and large, things work out, and there's a lot of cool coincidence and in, incidents coincidences in life that he's like, how did I meet that person? How did that work out? And so often we go back to this one period in our life for, as an example, say someone gets into a car accident, a car accident. And then every time they get into a car, they're afraid of getting into a car accident by the numbers. They're going to be okay. Right. They're going to be okay in this car ride, but they're so focused. That's what trauma is. It like heavily focuses us on one incident or sometimes a series of incidents and say, that's the whole truth. Not really. In the scheme of things, that was one accident from thousands and thousands of times you drove in a car, and now you probably learned something from it. Right. Maybe you're driving a safer car, wearing a seatbelt, not speeding, not driving in the rain. There's something you probably learned from it that will allow you to be a little bit safer, but we don't do that. We, we almost meditate on the negative. Mm. So what I found is one of the best ways to start believing in ourselves um, in the world, and it's not mine. This is from... <laughs> From the, from the steps as well, is to continuously remind ourselves of the things that are working, the things that um, we are improving on. Saying like, wow, I could believe in it. I could believe in myself. I used to watch porn every day. Now yeah, like I what are some of those things that are working for you? Week. There are so many things. Our relationship, right? What are, what are the chance that we meet? This space, how do we find this space? There's so many, you can do it with anything. Right. Just saying like, wow, there's something that's, there are things that are working in my favor. There are coincidences that I can meditate on. There are things that are improving. A great tool for me, I, I've journaled a lot. I do it less so now, but you know, in that building phase, I was journaling every single day. Mm -hmm. So on some days when I felt like, man, this work is never ending. Yeah, go back and read your journals from two years ago. Tell me it's never ending because there's no way that you're on this process right. and you're not seeing any changes? Of course not. Right. Makes no sense. I do want to say one thing because I spoke about fears, resentments, guilt, and shame as kind of four things that have to be eradicated, but they are very different and we should do discussions on it. I just want to say one thing about guilt. So shame is more of that feeling that, that we got to get rid of, that feeling that I am bad, independent of what we do or don't do. It's just this sometimes an icky feeling or disgusting feeling like there's something wrong with me to my mm -hmm. core. Guilt, I'll separate more in terms of 
maybe things we've done that are actually wrong or hurt others. The idea there, it's not like washing away fears, like, oh, let me get rid of fears. Mm -hmm. Let me pray them away or some other way of getting rid of fears. When we've wronged someone, it's actually righting that wrong. That that's the way to get rid of that guilt. So I, I didn't want to make it sound like, okay, we just want to sit there and eradicate all guilt. Hey, if there's someone you stole money from, return the money. That's how you eradicate right, right. the guilt. And then become a, a preacher on the importance of not stealing <laughs> money. I mean, right. there's, there are ways to eradicate guilt. It's not always an internal process. It's a longer discussion for a different time, but I just wanted to have that framework for yeah. um, what, what I'm talking about when I say, when I say this work. How close, uh, how, like, uh, listening to, um, you know, the framework that, that, that you're kind of painting here, um, fear and resentment sound like, almost like their own pillars, but guilt and shame feel so interconnected. I'm, I'm making a distinction between the two. So if guilt, I can say, is more focused on our actions, it's what I've done that... Um, not what is done was to wrong. you because guilt, guilt. Can sometimes we take, sometimes we, we take responsibility for stuff that was done for me. So I feel guilty in some way, but it's more, I'm more relating that to an action and guilt over that shame is more internal. It's this, you know, at one point for, for me, one of the feelings that like stuck with me just took like years to wash off and probably very related to the sexual, to being sexually abused as a child was a feeling that I'm disgusting. I just couldn't freaking shake that off. It had nothing to do with what I did. It just was there, was this stain on my soul or something. That's what it felt like. And just years of scrubbing that off and saying like, that's not there anymore. I feel like, I, I, I feel more comfortable in my skin. It's a, different, it's a different way of saying it. So while they do sound similar and they're often intertwined, um, you know, one, one writer, I think I said, shame is I am bad. Guilt is I did bad. <laughs>